Thank you for the introduction and uh, also thank you to the organizers for the invitation to this meeting. I've taken the liberty to slightly modify the title in order to be able to really speak out of uh, best personal experience. The general topic is reimplantation versus remodeling. And just to make a comment, if it hadn't been for some crazy surgeons who work in um, some countries, uh, the debate would, be, would have been closed 15 years ago. But it's still active, and let me bring you some details. The techniques were originally designed to treat patients with aortic root aneurysm and aortic regurgitation, and the hypothesis was if we, make the di if we eliminate the dilatation, if we make root geometry normal, then the valve will function well. There were some differences in terms of uh, elasticity uh, of the postoperative root. And in choosing a certain technique, and this has been part of my personal evolution, we also need to um, accommodate anatomic aspects. Not always do we have an aortoventricular junction at the transition between cusp and aorta or ventricle, but at times we have actually ventricle inside the sinus. This is an anatomic variation in which the aortoventricular junction is higher than the um, basal ring, as termed by Bob Anderson. This is a setting that uh, poses problems for reimplantation or any procedure that needs this section all the way down to the basal ring. And this anatomic feature actually prompted me to look more into root remodeling at a time when it was al already weakening. Some other details why I kept on focusing on root remodeling, just one slide from many. Here a comparison between the two operations, my personal experience. You see much more extensive concomitant surgery. Nevertheless, I saved half an hour of ischemic time. And some uh, additional uh, aspects all contributed to myself actually stopping to do reimplantation 10 years ago. So I've focused on root remodeling as my primary choice for root replacement. The debate will be difficult because I will have to debate against myself and Tyrone David. Uh, I will probably lose. But nevertheless, for tips and tricks, let me simply uh, focus on remodeling. One of the important aspects is the fact that remodeling and reimplantation do not always reach the goal, that is, valve function being normal at the end of the operation. I made the same mistakes, this was 15 years ago or so, and here in bicuspid valves I had to reoperate some patients which had an abnormal valve form. The analysis of these patients then uh, Um, showed me that quite apparently I had induced prolapse. Now, is this unusual or is this to be expected? Actually, it's not so, um, it's not so surprising. Let us assume we have a cusp as a segment of an ellipse. An ellipse has two radiuses. It could be a circle, and that's a special form of ellipse. We reduce the intercommissural distance, radius B to B prime, if we do not change anything on the circumference of the cusp, we will increase radius A to A prime. In other terms, we will induce prolapse by reducing root size. The analysis of these patients, actually, these mistakes, and you usually learn more through your own mistakes than your successes, made me hypothesize that the height difference between the basal plane and the free margins in diastole could be used as a configuration parameter also in valve-preserving surgery. Now, if we do that, and we could show, and I will on um, tomorrow or on Tuesday go into more detail, we can only use it if we have a normal amount of tissue. So. Let's assume our cusp is normal. We can use effective height 
which will directly correlate with prolapse or no prolapse. If we have a retracted cusp, this will have an effect also. What is a normal height? Let me tell you, there was very little data in the literature, so we measured 600 aortic valves, bicuspid and tricuspid, and for the tricuspid, just focus on the black bars, a normal geometric height is 20 millimeters. So geometric height is an information that we can use in order to determine whether we have a good substrate. And this is something we need to consider. So I will now take you through the details, through the important steps of the operation. What I first do is I measure geometric height, like in this case, 20 millimeters. There may be small fenestrations, like here, which are usually irrelevant. And fenestrations only need to be addressed if they're in, involved in the mechanism of prolapse. Measuring the basal diameter I have found to be important because often you will get a misleading value by TE in the annulus being much smaller compared to what you measure in the operating room. The next step is identical for reimplantation and remodeling except for the fact that the section goes a little further down in reimplantation. Mobilization of the root and excision of the root. I usually leave some, somewhere between five and seven millimeters of aortic wall remnant close to the cusp insertion line and I mobilize the coronary arteries just enough uh, to have enough room to move. As you can see here, I leave big buttons and you will see later why this can be helpful when you reconnect the buttons to the graft. The big and important question is, how do I choose my graft? There are rumors that in Toronto, a well-known surgeon takes a complex formula, adds the size of the patient, um, the height of um, the uh, cusp, um, barometric pressure, the thickness of his thumb, then throws the data away and takes a 30 or 32 millimeter graft. Maybe you can comment on that. I have a much simpler way of determining size of graft, at least for root remodeling. If I have a small patient, I take a 24 millimeter graft. If I have a normal patient, I take a 26 millimeter graft, and actually 95% of my grafts are 26 millimeters. A few years ago, I decided that I rarely needed a 28 millimeter graft. Because root size and cusp size must somehow correlate, a smaller valve needs a smaller root in order to accommodate, to really uh, generate the valve function, if geometric height is less than 20 milli millimeters, I simply take one size less, two millimeters less. This is so simple that even I can remember it. Now, for the graft, I cut three tongues, and in cutting the height of these incisions, or in determining the height, you need to consider the crimping, which varies between different grafts. I use the uh, Albo graft by Lemaitre. They have 120 degree markers, which I simply find very practical. And as you can see here, this incision that looked to be like it was slightly more than a centimeter, now in extended form is roughly two and a half centimeters or so. I don't have to be a genius. Now, if I was a genius like Marc de Jacob, Alain Carpentier, and so forth, I would know exactly how high to cut before I actually do the operation. I'm not a genius. I bleed when I am cut. I'm a normal human being. So I make with intention these incisions somewhat shorter than I think they should be. Different from Magdi, I start suturing in the center of the sinus. Why? Two very simple reasons. 
if number one, if it bleeds later on in the center of the sinus, this is the most difficult part of the suture line to expose. So I actually do it in an open fashion to be absolutely certain that these stitches are precise. The second, because I want to be able to extend my incisions, um, it's of course best I start in the center. Now, one of the problems that you can generate in the operating room, whether you do reimplantation or remodeling, is restriction of commissural height. Once you restrict commissural height, you have messed up your aortic valve and it may be very difficult to bring it to normal form again. For this, re in order to avoid that at all cost, I space the sutures in such a way that I keep my distance on the aorta roughly two to three millimeters between stitches. In the center of the sinus on the graft here, it will be the same, two to three millimeters. And then I increase this distance, thus placing more graft into the sinus than the aortic wall needs. The result will be a graft or a neo root in which only aortic tissue will limit the height of the commissures and never the graft. It may be arguable, and we could argue this, we could discuss this for half an hour to an hour. Do we need an annuloplasty? And this is something that maybe we can do after the debate. Um, in order to accommodate all instances, also those where there is muscle inside the sinus or the basal ring is lower than the otoventricular junction, I decided nine years ago, because I was not comfortable with an external ring to go into the concept of suture annuloplasty with a PTFE suture. This very complex annuloplasty is shown here, a CV0 PTFE fixed at the level of the nadirs of the three sinuses, and then simply tied around a Hagar. It's very inexpensive and not very time consuming. It is very effective. Simply cut the graft short, stick a Hagar inside, and for a 26 millimeter graft, I will use a 25 millimeter Hagar. For a 24 millimeter graft, I will use a 23 millimeter Hagar, very similar to what I, to, to the algorithm I have for choosing graft size. If you believe that at that time the operation is finished, you also believe that butterflies produce butter. Remember what I said about any change of intercommissural distance, the mistakes I made before. We have a high chance of having induced prolapse at that time. How can we detect prolapse? Either we're a genius like Tyrone David. He looks inside and he knows exactly what cusp configuration he must have or you're a human being like myself, and this is why I, 14 years ago, came up with, after I analyzed these failures and found a normal height difference of nine to 10 millimeters, I simply asked an instrument maker to produce the caliper I just saw, and this caliper will give me the height difference. It will tell me whether, the, whether this cusp has a normal form or is prolapsing. If it's prolapsing, don't freak out. This is no problem. Correcting that prolapse is very easy. Keep in mind from the failures. Prolapse comes from simply the cusp margin hanging through. If you now reduce the circumference, you will bring it up. You can bring it up to the normal height. And of course, always, as a second, I'm a control freak. I never trust one assessment only, always double check by surgical inspection. These simple interrupted suture in the center 
of the cusp are placed in a low stress area and they have been a very durable solution for me in the last 20 some years. Once the valve looks good, once the valve has normal effective height, I don't do a water test. Three to four centimeters of water column will tell you very little or nothing in comparison to a diastolic blood pressure of 70 or 80 millimeters mercury. I simply trust inspection and measurement. And then come the final sutures. You can see here the big buttons are nice to have. I take double bites uh, on the coronary buttons and in the last 1500 root replacements I've not had to use felt or pericardial strip or anything else. But still the operation is not finished. Like I heard 15 minutes ago, the surgeon should not only listen to somebody who describes a TE result, he should familiarize himself with this technique and make sure that the final check looks like this. Let me summarize. I focused here on root remodeling because it simply requires less myocardial ischemia, and this has been one of the main reasons why this is the technique I've used mainly in the last 15 years. The important part, the important messages are any intervention on the root, even such a seemingly simple procedure as sinotubular junction remodeling, a graft suture to the sinotubular junction, may change intercommissural distance and thus valve configuration, you may induce prolapse or maybe also restriction. In any form of valve preserving surgery, the cusp or valve configuration must be at least near, ideally normal at the end of the operation. So actually valve preserving root replacement should be considered not an aortic operation, but really an aortic valve repair procedure. The measurement of geometric height is very simple and it helps you selecting the right substrate. Don't try, it's like in rheumatic mitral disease where the, disease, where the substrate may simply be suboptimal. Only here the operation that you either do or don't do will then be more complex. The measurement of effective height <laughs> in addition to a surgical judgment, helps in detecting cusp configuration abnormalities and guiding the intervention. And if annular dilatation is present, an annuloplasty may be added. Having said that, when eight years, seven or eight years ago, Tyrone and I left the room, left the lecture hall in Toronto, he said, if now we had a stable means of stabilizing the annulus, we wouldn't have to do re-implantation anymore. I will leave it as such, and I'm not sure he would openly admit he said that. Thank you for your attention, and for those interesting, interested in learning more, we do regular courses. The next one will be in September, and simply drop me an email. Thank you. <laughs>